I hit intros. That time I got reincarnated as a slime season two part one, e episode one. Rimuru is still kicking it with the kids and he tells them that he is going to be staying there until the end of the term, but then he is going back to his new foundation. They're all kind of soon today f***s about it and then we get a new character in Professor Tits who comes in to teach the class in Rimuru's stead. We get an unnecessary flashback of all the things that happened in season one rendering my job basically useless. Never mind, the flashback was actually super vague. I don't even know why they bothered doing it to be honest. As you guys might remember from season one, Rimuru had a little bit of a run-in with Demon Lord Carrion. Don't worry though, they managed to work things out and signed a non-aggression pact. Not only that, but the Jura Tempest Federation and the Animal Kingdom of Urizania agreed to send delegates to one another. The sexy ginger Benny Maru is appointed to be the leader of the delegations with Rieger joining him as his assistant. Rimuru makes a shitty speech and then the delegates head out for Demon Lord Carrion's territory. Once they have left, all of the other side characters start preparing for the Urizanian delegates to arrive there. When the delegates arrive, we meet my new favorite character in Albis the Golden Serpent. Joining her on the delegation is the confrontational Sufia the White Tiger Claw. Sufia starts talking some mad shit about humans and how Rimuru shouldn't associate with them. Because Yom is a loyal follower and a human also, Rimuru isn't gonna let him get disrespected, so he gives him permission to fight Sufia. Luckily, Shion isn't taking this shit either, so she decides to fight in his place. To be fair, she probably knew that my boy was about to get his ass handed to him. While their little fight is going on, we meet Grucius, who is a Biscuitier's runt. He is ordered by Albies to fight with Yom instead, so they get their fight underway as well. Episode 2. Shion starts charging up a maximum magic bullet and then Albi steps in to put an end to the fight. The delegates were testing Rimuru and his followers to see if they were worthy of their respect and since they passed in the fights, they can now sit as equals. Later on, while they're welcoming the guests properly, we learn that Albi and Sophia are kind of alcoholics. The two of them make a deal with Rimuru to send fruit from Urizania because it's kind of known for it. And in exchange, Rimuru agrees to hook them up with some more alcohol. Because Rimuru isn't a trade expert, he doesn't know what the ratio should be for the fruit to boost trade. That's when he has to call in the little puppers in Kobe, who is a kobold merchant. This adorable little guy owns his own shop in Tempest and is managing all of the merchants. A few days later, the delegates left to return to Urizania. We see that Grucius had received orders from Phobio to stay behind and help out in the Tempest Nation. The Tempest delegates that went to Urizania also returned back home to report back what they had found. The Tempest Nation was superior in a lot of ways, but one way that Urizania had passed them is in agriculture. Rimuru decides that on their next delegation, they need to focus on learning more about their agriculture, but in the meantime, he's gonna head to the Dwarf Kingdom. We also learned that Benimaru had challenged Carrion to a fight and lost pretty badly, meaning that Carrion's pretty fucking strong. Rimuru then heads to Dwargo, the Dwarven capital, along with Gopta, Gobzo, Shuna, Shion, and Kaijin squad. Once they had arrived, Rimuru goes with a posse to meet with King Gazelle. Before we see what goes on with that, though, we hop over to Claim who is having an interesting meeting. He appears to be forcing a new character in Mulan to spy on the Tempest Nation. E episode 3. They discuss the fact that the Tempest Nation is well on its way to replacing Falmuth as the major trade center. Although Dwargo and Falmuth are on good terms with one another, Gazelle warns Rimuru that he doesn't like their king. The next day, there's a declaration made to the public saying that Dwargo and the Tempest Nation are now friends. That was pretty much all they needed to handle in Dwargo, so they get ready to return back to the Tempest Nation. Meanwhile, the next day, we see that Yom is approached by Mulan. She's requesting to join their little ragtag party, and Yom doesn't want to, so then they have a little skirmish to see if she can prove herself, and she wins handily, so the two end up becoming friends. E episode 4. Rimuru returns to the kids to give them the results on their final exams. All the kids pass or whatever, who the fuck cares? And then we see that Yom and Mulan have arrived at the Tempest Nation. Yom informs everybody that Mulan is going to be their new consultant and military advisor to help them fight against magic because apparently they're lacking in that department. While talking with Mjolnir, we learn that the Tempest Nation and Blumen have entered a security pact. This means that if Blumen is going to be attacked through the forest, then the Tempest Nation will have to step in. And in return, if the Tempest Nation is ever under attack, then Blumen will also aid them. While Rimuru is under the impression that nobody's gonna invade Tempest Nation, Mjolnir warns that Falmuth might not be too happy about them becoming the new trade center. This cues us to hop on over to Falmuth where we see the king discussing things with his subordinates. They discuss the rapidly expanding Tempest Nation and decide that the best time to strike them is now so they don't have to compete with them for their trade. This is when we meet the new character Archbishop Rayheim, who appears to have some sort of plan. He says that the Western Holy Church's headquarters plans to subjugate 
the nation of monsters as an opposition of God and enemies. They plan to make it look like the Tempest Nation had harmed one of their citizens. Once that is the case, the Temple Knights will be able to head out and subjugate the monsters. They plan to send some other worlders ahead of the knights as a show of force. The three other worlders will be joined by a hundred knights as an advance party. We get a look at the three other worlders and Shogo, Kirara, and Kiyoya. Episode 5. My boy Yom is trying to get in there with Miulam and is making some pretty good progress. The next day, Miulan is contacted by Clayman, who has control of her heart and is forcing her to do these things because if she doesn't, then he can kill her. He explains that he has one more job for her and if she doesn't do it, then he's gonna kill Yom also. Soe was doing some reconnaissance and had noticed the Falmuth Knights approaching the Tempest Nation. He reports this to the others, but they are still waiting the return of Rimuru. In the middle of their talk, they are then contacted by Albis. She requests that the Tempest Nation take in her people as refugees. This is because the kingdom of Yurizania is preparing to go to war with the demon lord Malim. The three other worlders arrive at the Tempest Nation. They were given the orders by the king of Falmuth to play the victims of a Tempest Nation attack. Kirara puts on some porn level acting to act like Gobzo had grabbed her ass and then threw her to the ground. Her ability Bewilder allows her to make everybody think that she's telling the truth. Gobzo comes to his rescue and even though he knows that Gobzo is innocent, he still apologizes on his behalf. Kirara is enraged that nobody believes her, so she tries using her Bewilder ability to order everybody nearby to die. Usually, this would cause everybody nearby to drop dead, but Shuna and Shion show up negating the attack. The two sides get into a bit of a skirmish, and while that's going on, we see that Mulan has been ordered by Clayman to turn the area into a non-magic area. This will allow them to cut the city's communication off. Crucius had come across Mulan and confronts her, saying that she hasn't been acting right. She believes that the reason Clayman is asking her to cut off the communications is because Malim had declared war. Rimuru getting involved could be problematic, which is why he wants to isolate them. Mulan takes on her true form, and Grucius comes to the conclusion that Clayman is forcing her to do something. Yom just so happens to be passing by, so he gets filled in on everything happening. He tells her that he'll love her no matter what, all that good shit, and then she knocks out the communications anyways. Archbishop Rahim is also there, and he casts prison filled over the area as well. E episode 6. All the kids cry like little bitches because Rimuru is heading back to the Tempest Nation. While heading back, Rimuru senses a presence, so he requests Ranga to hide in his shadow. The Great Sage skill comes online and tells him that he's been caught in a barrier that would prevent him from leaving. So his body double briefly shows up to warn Rimuru that there are enemies nearby and that he should flee. He gets caught up in another barrier that would prevent him from using magic, but thanks to his resistibility, he can still use magic, it's just going to be hindered. He is then approached by a new character and he not as Saki. Gucci, who is the chief knight of the Imperial Guard and the captain of the Holy Knights of the Holy Empire of Rubrios. Hinata says some shit about wanting to destroy the Tempest Nation, so obviously Rimuru has to die. Meanwhile, back in the Tempest Nation, everybody is losing their fights to their respective opponents because they can't use their full strength thanks to the barrier stripping them of their magic. Anyways, back over to Hinata and Rimuru. Hinata attacks Rimuru, claiming that he is the monster responsible for killing Shizu. Rimuru makes a counterclaim, saying that he knew Shizu and that she had asked him to find and help Hinata. While arguing, Rimuru finds out that Hinata's informant knew that he was Japanese. The Great Sage uses the unique ability to generate to isolate the superior spirit Ifri as a pure spirit. This allows Rimuru to summon Ifri to help him out in the fight. Hinata's unique ability, Usurper, allows her to steal her opponent's abilities. But because there was a magic circuit between Ifri and Rimuru, Ifri was not stolen. Feeling like Rimuru has no way out, he decides that he needs to use his gluttony ability. In the last scene, as he gives the order to the Great Sage to act activate his gluttony ability, he loses consciousness. E episode 7. Rimuru takes on a form specialized for combat, incorporating the traits of various objects and monsters. Hinata launches a bunch of powerful attacks, ending with a disintegration attack that nearly kills Rimuru. <laughs> Turns out, Rimuru was never actually fighting her. He had Eat Free distract her so that he could create a doppelganger and then slip away into hiding and avoid the fight. Rimuru speculates that even without the barrier, he still would have lost because of Hinata's disintegration attack. Once the fight had concluded, Rimuru tries teleporting to the Tempest Nation, but can't due to the barrier. They have to settle for teleporting nearby where they run into some side characters and explain the situation. The Great Sage analyzes the barrier and tells him that it's anti-magic area. This is similar to the barrier that Hinata was using, but it's an inferior version. 
version. Rimuru tasks Soe with going and finding who's erecting the barrier while he goes to find who's using this great magic. We then hop on over to Benimaru who is trying to get to and kill Miulan because she had sabotaged their magic. Both Grucius and Yom are trying to prevent him from doing so. Rimuru gets there in time to intervene and agrees to hear her out after what she had done. She tells him that she's prepared to accept responsibility for the carnage that she had caused and he doesn't understand what she's talking about so she has to take him to show him. She takes him to where a handful of goblins were being kept after they were killed in the attack. Rimuru reflects back on his words from season 1 ordering them not to kill any humans which is part of the reason that they didn't defend themselves and were killed. Mulan is trying her best to upset Rimuru into killing her and leaving everybody else out of it. He stays calm and wants to hear her out so everybody meets to have a conference. After gathering all the details, Rimuru comes to the conclusion that the Western Holy Church and the Kingdom of Falmuth had been colluding from the start. Mulemire chimes in and says that the reasoning is because the Western Church doesn't like monsters and Falmuth wants to keep their trade to themselves. Rimuru then requests that Mulemire go to the Kingdom of Lumen and tell them about the current situation and the imminent threat from Falmuth. And in the last scene, Mulan comes clean about serving the Demon Lord Clayman. E episode 8. She explains that Clayman's overall goal is to get the Tempest Nation and the Kingdom of Falmuth to go to war with one another. Rimuru decides to postpone Mulan's punishment and instead just imprisons her for now. Rimuru is then informed by Benny Maru that Shion and Gobzo were both killed in the fighting while trying to protect the innocent. No more big tits resting on his little jello head. That's when the three adventurers from season one show up looking for Rimuru. They tell him that although unlikely, there is a fairy tale about bringing the dead back to life. So I had discovered the Western Holy Church's forces all camped around the city and each camp is guarding a magic device. But anyways, back to the revival thing where Eren tells Rimuru a story about a girl and a dragon. The girl was the daughter of a human and a dragon. And of course, they don't go into any nitty gritty details about the night she was conceived, but man, I bet it's a fucking hell of a story. She was raised as a dragon princess, then one day Papa Dragon made a double of himself in the form of a baby dragon. And this adorable little fucking dragon ended up becoming her companion. But things kind of get shitty when the king tries to take control over the dragon princess and ends up killing the little baby companion dragon in the process. The girl gets a tiny bit emotional and decides to go full John Wick on the king and his entire nation. After she was done slaughtering tens of thousands of innocent people, she had transformed into a demon lord. When she had transformed, the baby dragon miraculously came back to life. The tiny drawback to that is the dragon had lost its soul in the process, so when it came back, it was an evil monster that destroyed everything in its path. This dragon became known as the Chaos Dragon. The first thing the girl did as a demon lord was seal away her once beloved companion. Rimuru states that there's no point in bringing him back to life if they don't have a soul, so why bother? Eren goes on to explain that the city is still surrounded by a barrier. She speculates that this barrier is actually preventing the souls from leaving. There's like a 3% chance that this actually works, but you have to remember that Shion has big tits, so in anime talk, that's basically 99%. We also find out the fun fact that Eren is actually Eryun Grimwald and is a princess. Woo! After the talk, we learn from the great sage that Rimuru has already acquired the Demon Lord Seed. He had acquired the seed when he defeated the Orc Disaster in Season 1. So now all he has to do is meet the conditions and he can evolve into a true Demon Lord. The minimum amount of nourishment required to have the seed sprout is around 10,000 human souls. That conveniently segues into Rimuru finding out that the Falmuth forces are marching on the Tempest Nation with 20,000 men. Rimuru comes in and tells Mulan that she's gonna have to die and so she gets up and kisses Yom and is prepared to go willingly. Turns out Rimuru's kind of a dick to everybody because he was never actually planning on killing her. But on the plus side, it was kind of elaborate wingmanning because Yom did get a kiss. The artificial heart that Clayman gave to Mulan to keep her alive was actually a bug. This allowed him to spy on her and by destroying this, Rimuru makes Clayman think that Mulan is dead. Rimuru had made an artificial heart of his own and replaced it so that she could stay alive. Not only does this save her life, but now she is free from Clayman's rule as well. When asked what she's gonna do with her newfound freedom, she basically says that she's gonna fuck you. Rimuru also informs everybody that he's planning on killing all of the forces coming here from Falmuth. This includes the king and all of his top officers, so once they're all dead, he's gonna need somebody to replace the king. Yom gets the news that he is the one up for promotion, and he's going to be placed as king of Falmuth once everybody's dead. E episode 9. Rimuru says that he'll take care of the main force heading towards them, while the others are assigned to take out the magic devices forming the barriers. Shuna and Mulan are assigned to replace the barrier once it's taken down so that they can keep the souls inside. In the last couple of 
of scenes, we see that everybody is going to fulfill their proper role in the plan. Episode 10. Many Maru, Gaburu, and Soei had all gone to the sites that they were assigned, wiped out the soldiers, and destroyed the devices. Meanwhile, Geld, Gapta, Hakuru, and Rigurd are assigned to attack the camp where the three other worlders are stationed. Geld scores up to take on Shogo, while Hakuro goes to fight Kyoya. Kyoya's skill, All Seeing Eye, allows him to detect all motion around him at 300 times the normal speed, so he's pretty confident he's gonna take on Hakuro. As anybody might guess, Hakuro is still moving way faster than that. He uses this insane speed to decapitate Kiyoya and makes him think back on all of his evil deeds as he's dying. But anyways, we're gonna hop back on over to Geld and Shogo. Geld uses his rod ability, so Shogo is on the back foot, and as Geld goes to kill him, Hakuro makes his appearance. He shows Shogo that he had killed Kiyoya already and that he's next. Shogo, of course, panics like a little bitch and then tries to run off to find Kirara, who he kills in order to gain the survivor ability. This does fucking nothing. He just gets his ass kicked by Geld and then rejects generates all of the damage he took so he could get his ass kicked again. After dealing a fair bit of punishment, Geld decides that he's gonna finish the job, but then a new character in Rosin steps in to stop him. Rosin deters the attack and then escapes with Shogo using his teleportation. They had no choice but to let him go because Hakuru states that he had rigged himself with nuclear strike magic and his death was acting as the trigger. All four magical devices around the city are destroyed, so Shuna and Mulan replace the barrier with one of their own. Now that that's taken care of, Rimuru prepares to take out the army and transform into a true demon lord. But before that can happen, we hop back on over to Shogo and Razen. Razen says that he's going to heal Shogo, but then ends up killing his soul instead. He then transfers his own soul into Shogo's body and takes on his abilities as well. This makes him the most powerful Majin in Falmu's history, and maybe even on par with the demon lord. And in the last couple of scenes, we see that Rimuru is racking up his insane kill streak, rapidly approaching his 10,000 and necessary souls. E episode 11. Rimuru is using an anti-magic barrier over the area where the army is located so nobody can teleport to escape. They're basically fish in a barrel at this point so he kills Razin and this procs the king to try and enter negotiations with him. The king suggests that the declaration of war was actually a misunderstanding and he's wanting to be friends. On top of that, he requests that Rimuru pay compensation for their losses and then they can enter negotiations so Rimuru blows off the dude's arm. Right after that, Rimuru gets the unique skill Merciless. This means that if somebody loses their will to fight in the face of that skill, they end up dying. The acquisition of the new skill is nice or whatever, but he's only at 57% of the required number of souls that he needs to complete the transformation. Rimuru uses his new Merciless skill, which harvests the souls of all of the humans nearby. Now that Rimuru has collected enough souls, he begins his evolution into a demon lord. The drawback to this is that he gets super tired, so he summons Ronga to protect him because he can't fight in this state. Rimuru then removes the anti-magic barrier and uses all of the nearby bodies to summon three demons, one of which is Black. Because Rimuru is transforming into a demon lord, Black and the other two demons are wanting to serve him. This isn't the only perk to him transforming, as all of his other followers are going to receive perks as well. Ronga gets Rimuru the Archbishop and King back to everybody else where they take the prisoners into custody. He then undergoes a transformation where he turns from a slime into a demon slime. Because of this, all of his physical abilities have significantly improved. We then get a series of skill transformations. First off, the Great Sage requests to evolve into Words of the World. It doesn't really show the outcome to that one, but then he gets the skill Wise One. Wise One then attempts to evolve. When attempting to evolve Wise One, it fails continuously while the Great Sage tries over and over. The Great Sage then takes a different approach by sacrificing the Degenerate skill in order to upgrade the Wise One skill. This finally makes the evolution successful and it turns into an ultimate skill called Raphael. Rumoru then decides to sacrifice his Merciless ability to upgrade his Gluttony ability. This evolves the Gluttony skill into another ultimate skill called Beelzebub. After all that bullshit, we hop back on over to Razin, who is still inside of Shogo's body and survived 
survived thanks to his survivor ability. He then comes face to face with Black and the other two demons. Black is kind of humiliating this guy, so he decides to put an anti-magic barrier and fight him hand to hand. This should be an advantage for Rosin because he still has Shogo's berserker ability, but he's still getting his ass kicked, which makes him come to the conclusion that it's possible that Black is a primordial. I guess Rosin died? I'm not really sure. His eyes just get super small that he passes out or some shit, and then Black says it's over, so I guess it's over. The Harvest Festival transformation that Rimuru was undergoing finally completes, and so it's time to bestow the gifts onto those connected to him. This causes all of his followers to get stronger, but they pass out in the process. He then uses his Beelzebub ability to collect all of the magic kills nearby. Using the magic kills, he plans to resurrect all of his allies that were killed. The problem is that he still doesn't have enough magic kills, so he prepares to expend his own life energy in substitution. Black suggests the alternative of using the two demons that had come with him as a substitution instead of Rimuru's life energy. Now that he has enough energy, he can begin the secret art of spirit resurrection. In the last couple of scenes, Rimuru completes the resurrection and then he passes out. Episode 12. We then hop on back up to the present where Rimuru regains consciousness with Shion alive and well. We also learn that Rimuru's followers had all evolved along with his great sage ability which had transformed into Raphael. We then hop back a bit to where Malim had gone to Urizania. She declares war on Carrion and all of his people. Carrion doesn't want to get everybody involved with the battle because they'll likely die, so he decides that he's going to fight Malim alone while everybody else retreats to the Jura Forest. During the fight, we see that Demon Lord Frey had teamed up with Malim to fight against Carrion. She attacks Carrion from behind, taking him by surprise and kills him. The entirety of Urizania is wiped out due to Malim's power, but they did manage to get all of the citizens to safety. Rimuru agrees to take in the refugees and give them a place to stay. They all speculate that it's outside of Malim's nature to fight dirty like that, so something else might be going on. After the fight had concluded, Demon Lord Frey was seen flying towards Clayman's domain. But anyways, we hop on over to Black, who makes a formal request to stick around and serve Rimuru. Rimuru agrees to this, and since now he's his new follower, he gives him the name Diablo. Bestowing the name, of course, strains magic kills, but it takes a little bit more than Rimuru was expecting. Even though his magic kills had grown tenfold since his evolution, he still loses half of them while bestowing the name, meaning that Diablo is probably going to be popping off in future episodes. Rimuru then reflects on the upcoming challenges. There is the inevitable showdown with Clayman, the aftermath dealing with the Kingdom of Falmuth, and of course, the Western Holy Church who are still going to be gunning for them. Raphael then chimes in to state that it might not be as hard as he thinks. This is because the appraisal of Unlimited Imprisonment, which is the ability that's keeping Veldora sealed away, is almost complete. Raphael speculates that once Veldora is free, that'll keep the Western powers in check. Once the appraisal is complete, Rimuru creates a body double for Veldora to inhabit. And in the last couple of scenes, Veldora inhabits the body, which turns him into a blonde stud. I'm gonna be doing the future seasons, and you can find that in the left side whenever I'm finished with it, or you can check out all of it. That time I got reincarnated as a slime videos in the playlist on the right side. You can also find the links in the description below, and the only thing I hate more than intros is outros.